Hello, my name is Delia Robinson and I'm here with a Cranky that was made originally for a young person's graphic novel camp. And I was asked to come and talk about my, the book that I, the graphic novel I've written. And the reason I chose a Cranky style is that the book is written in two separate styles. One for the main character, Peter, that's his, it's, it's a chatty, colorful cartoon style, and the other style is no words at all, the story of his grandfather, and they alternate. And I didn't see any way that I could stand in front of a room full of children and point out things here. So I turned it into a cranky format, and a cranky is a primitive form of television, or, and uh, it's sort of been making a resurgence. It's very popular for, for street theater and protest theater. So, and as I crank through, I'll use the profess professorial pointing stick. One of the children at the graphic novel camp said this was gruesome. It's a Barbie doll head on a ski pole, but it was my ch a re relic from my daughters growing up when this was the scepter. So I'm gonna use it for the professor's, professor's device. No another word is when I work and am happily working, I'm amazingly messy, and this Cranky didn't have the controlling influence of a ballad, which most of my cranky, all of my crankies have been song and ballad crankies. But this one had nothing except for what it was like to write this book, this accidental book. And so it, it has scribbling all over it. When you make anything of this sort or a novel, don't do all the scribbling. Nobody wants to read it. So here we go. This is it, an accidental graphic novel, a shirtwaist story. And this is a cityscape. All right, on with the glasses. I made a graphic novel, but I didn't mean to make it. I made lots of mistakes. And then here, this is, I've decided to make myself look better than I do, so that's allegedly me. It says, I didn't plan the plot. I didn't plan any plot at all, it just came to be a plot that could be stated in one sentence. A man had a secret. Next problem, I didn't think about the future. All the characters in a cartoon must move in the direction of the future because, and that in our world is that way. And I just had people going higgly-piggly any which direction and had to correct all that later when it came time to go to press. And uh, an example of how the problem of that can be is with a little cranky I made for a song, which I'm not going to sing. Oh, dear me, my crap. There. Um, but it's going exactly backwards. You crank it through, and the song is stop kicking my dog around. Every time I go to town, the boys are kicking my dog around. Dog around, dog around. You better stop kicking my dog around. That's the song, the end. And so the way I do it in my dyslexic way was starting with the end and going backwards all the way through. So when you think about doing a cartoon or a, a graphic novel, by all means, think which way is the future and let all the action take place heading that way. So that was something I didn't think about. And another thing I didn't think about was I almost forgot to give my character some special feature so they could be recognized from one picture to the next. And so think about if you're doing this, give somebody a top knot or red hair or really big eyes or a funny hat, anything. I didn't mean to do it, I didn't think about it, but as it happened, my main character is bald. So he was bald and I have lots of sticking out white hair. So that took care of this problem. But I had, it's good to think about it. So here's this cranky about how I made this accidental book. And here right away we have a problem. Here's a huge mend where I didn't think about what was going on and I had to glue things together and they're all not good. But what is this? That is where I was trying to think about when I, who my character was gonna be. And you have many options here. It could be a story about Babar, which it's not. And I thought, well, that was all. I like that idea. I like the idea of it being whoops about an ogre. That's a much better story and pretty interesting. But it wasn't. It was a story about me writing a book. And so there it is. That's me beautified. And we'll stick her right on there and let her tell the story as long as she can stay in place. So what's here? This is the story. I had drawn it as just arms, disembodied arms. It was a horrible sight. So that's why this head got stuck on there. OK, I found a book in a free box. That's true. 
I found it in the free box, but the free box was in the library. But I recommend don't draw in the whole thing if it's too much work. I just drew a landscape that was much easier than drawing the library with all those stacks and books. And then I knew a person. It says I met a person, but I had known a person who told me many stories about his family. This is Peter. And Another thing here is his eyebrows. I don't draw all that well, I think, and so I use eyebrows pretty heavily. I recommend eyebrows. If they're going this way, it says one thing, and if it goes this way, another. And so he obviously is a little anxious, um, and he really doesn't look like this at all. But I went home, and I made cartoons about his stories, and I drew my cartoons in the pages of that book I found in the free pile, because the book was named Peter. Here it is. This is the book. And I scribbled all in it. All of his stories are in this book, like that, page after page after page. He'd tell me a thing, I'd draw it. And then I, weeks might pass, I'd see him again, he'd tell me another one of these stories. And the stories were interesting to me because they were so totally different from the, anything in my own life. He used to, grew up in wealth in, in New York City on Park Avenue, and I grew up as a growing weed out in the country. So. It fascinated me, and I went home and I drew his stories into the pages of this library book that had been discarded and was very shabby but had nice paper. But the question is, was this okay? I still have trouble thinking about what I did, that I didn't tell him, I'm drawing pictures of your life. I just did it. And the reason I didn't think I needed to tell him is because I never expected that anyone else would see it but me. It was for my own pleasure and amusement to kind of try to make these stories he told have a, have a life that went on in my imagination. And so there is this woman who should be me drawing. And here is a little tip that I discovered along the way, this hand. I was tired of drawing that hand. Hands are hard to draw. So I just set a coffee cup there. And I use that a, a lot when I'm drawing a cartoon or a, a graphic novel. I just put things in front of the things I don't want to draw. So here it is. Here's the book. I drew and I drew and I drew intermittently for years. It says here, book very shabby. So here's all the pages coming out of this book that I've been drawing on. And that's how they look. And over time, my drawings changed a little bit. But I didn't really mind that the style had ev was evolving. The drawings began with the unfortunate story of my friend Peter's birth. And there it is. I say, yuck, as does his father, yuck. Peter was born, and the doctor says, good God, Peter was born with a, a problem called projectile vomiting, pyloric stenosis. It, the baby vomits not just a little bit, it shoots it quite a distance. And it's shocking to see and terrible for the baby because they quickly dehydrate and they die. And so the doctor was, said, good God, that's a problem. And here's Peter looking like a pink larvae going, erp. Nothing stayed down. So I just drew it. I didn't correct anything. I didn't redo anything. I just drew and drew and drew. Because after all, it was just for me. And then the doctor says, looking very pleased, this baby will need immediate surgery. Oh, darn, says the mother. And the baby's going, erp. And then the doctor says, still pleased, it's a very difficult, long recovery, big scar, lots of nursing care is needed. That's him, the mother says. But. But we were going to, we were planning to spend the summer at Cape Cod. And then down here, pinned in with a paper clip, which the editor let me do, all, little notes throughout the book that things I learned later. It says not Cape Cod, Long Beach. That's what I learned later was the right place. Here's the dad sneaking off looking yellow and miserable. I always drew him as a yellow, miserable looking guy. So there he is, there she says, the doctor says. Well, go to Cape Cod. We'll take care of everything. You can pick him up at the end of the summer. And the baby says, gee, thanks, as he vomits. And that's how Peter spent his first summer. He was left at the hospital. And I said to him, why would your mother do that and leave her darling little newborn <laughs> erping baby in the hospital for several months? And he said she respected what the doctor said so much that she thought that must be the right thing. And so there's his first summer. And the book goes on and on. One thing about Peter's style, the drawings for Peter's part of the book, is that they, they look like that. And, and they just go on whenever I have a story I want to tell. That's what I do. One day, I met Peter in a cafe. And he was mopier than usual. 
And I say, what's wrong? And he says, with the talkie bubble in the wrong place, it should always be up somewhere where you can see it, because this looks like he still has a barfing disease. I said, what's wrong? He says, I'm thinking about my grandfather. And he told me his grandfather's story, and I drew that in a different style. And I didn't draw it in the book. I drew this on pieces of, of nice drawing paper. And I used no words with it, and I was inspired by these pictures by old photographs that were taken of the time that his grandfather lived. And his grandfather came as a young boy to the United States, a young man, maybe 18 or 19, from this muddy little village in Russia. They don't even know the name of it anymore, but it was a very crowded, nasty place. And it was in a part of Russia called the Pale, where people who were Jewish were forced to move, whether they wanted to or not. If you were rich, you could buy your way out of it, or if you were famous, you could get out of it. But everybody else just had to pick up whatever they owned and move. And they moved into this region where maybe a village would have 10,000 people in it, and overnight it would have 80,000 residents and not enough to eat and nowhere to sleep, and it was a real nightmare. So what happened is anyone who had a dime headed for the closest port and got on boats. And somehow or another, and they all helped each other do this. People shared, the, shared money so they could do it. And Peter's grandfather, he must be one of these people in this crowd, went to the boats and got on a boat going to America. And that was in 1894, I guess, or 92. And they sailed and sailed. This is my idea of what a long ocean voyage would look like. And then after a long time, they saw through the fog the city of Manhattan, the city of New York, that's Manhattan. And he, they got to Ellis Island, and they got through that, all that testing and stuff that went on at Ellis Island to make them, allow them to come to the United States. And off he goes into the city with his friends that he's made on the boat. And the city is jam-packed. They've ne high rise buildings, they've never seen anything like it. And they've got to wander through there to find Hester Street where the people from his part of the village of the, of the Pale now live. And there are the shabbiest, most torn down, wretched houses. And he had to find a place to live. And with, with this, there's something else about this kind of drawing that I discovered and other people have discovered before me is if you don't like the white that you've painted, Photoshop will, can pour it in. And when it pours it in, it kind of might spread in this magical way that I actually liked. Same with the black. The black is intensified by Photoshop, and it made the printing process better. OK, so and then one day I had a visitor, a wild man who turned out to be a publisher. And he said, heard you're doing something unusual. Can I see it? And I and he said, I want to publish this. After he saw it, I want to publish this. And I said, you can't do it. There I am. You can't do it. Why not, he says. And the reasons, we've already gone over them a little bit. It's someone else's story, times two. It's Peter's story, and he might not want it told. He probably doesn't. And it's the author of the book story. And she definitely won't want it told because she copyrighted that book. And I drew it. Number two, reason why not, I drew it on that copyright protected library book. The library book part is not the problem. The problem is the copyright that says you cannot use that material in any way you want. And the printed words are clearly readable through my paintings. There's no question what book it is. And um, also number three, whoop, up here, the pictures are drawn in two different styles. The grandfather's style with the no words, Peter's style, all the colorful chat chat. And those styles just didn't look comfortable together at all. And I didn't see how a book could be made out of that. And he said, you're, you're clever. You'll find a way. And as for Peter, just ask him. So I thought, oh, OK. So I asked him. And what did he do? He walked away. This is a man who, when it, if, you, if he doesn't want to say no to someone, he just slightly turns and puts his head going the other direction. And that definitely means no. And I knew that that meant no. And so I just dropped the subject and said, can't be done. And occasionally, the, the publisher would call me up and say, did he change his mind? And I said, no. And then he said, ask him. And I said, I don't think I will. And a couple of years passed. And one day, I met Peter on the street. The actual truth was he came up to me in the farmer's market. And he said, remember what you asked me a few years ago? And I said, no. And I said, hmm, yes, I do. And he said, well, you can do it. But you don't know the whole story. And I thought, 
Oh, then he came over to my house and he signed a release. He's a shy man, so he just let me take a picture of him signing this paper, which says I can use the story in any way I want, but I can only show his legs and feet in the picture. And then he stole, told me the story of his grandfather. His grandfather arrived here penniless. He, Peter said, I came home from, the, from my summer in the hospital in a taxi, but he arrived down at the wharf on a very, very run-down boat and after this long and terrible voyage across the ocean. And in 10 years, this penniless boy became extremely rich. He had a great big house on Riverside Drive. He had servants. And that's known because of the 1911 census said so, or the 1910 census said so. And he also owned the largest sweatshop in America at that point, and maybe the whole wide world. It was called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. And the reason it was triangle is because it was in a building shaped by a tri like a triangle down in Greenwich Village. And shirtwaist is a garment, of a woman's uh, shirt, a blouse that looks like a shirt, but you tuck it in at your waist, so it's a shirtwaist. And then I drew stories about the factory because I started reading about these factories. They were kind of frightful, definitely frightful, in fact. Their wages were amazingly low. They, he, he hired young women to do the sewing who came from the same part of Russia he came from. They spoke Yiddish or Russian and didn't speak much English at all, if any. Um, they were required in mo most sweatshops, and I'm not, true, no, I'm not sure if this is true about his, but in most you were required to pay a rental fee for the chair you sat on out of your wages. You had to pay for the thread and for the needles you used. Even though the thread went into the garment that he sold, you still had to pay for the, the sewer, still had to pay for the thread. And you had to pay for the electricity to run the sewing machine, all taken out of your wages. People's wages were cut for all kinds of things. That was a punishment, was to cut your wages. And if you got up to go to the bathroom, it was so tight and crowded there that other people had to get up to, get, to move so that you could get out of that tight row. And this was an enormous hall with rows of sewing machines stretching as far as you could see from side to side, jam-packed in there. And it was a very, very difficult situation. There were thread girls, were the young girls that came to work sometimes with their mother, and they were used for pulling basting stitches. When I, if I were sewing a garment to hold things together before the sewing machine sewed it, you would sew it with great big hand sewn things to hold everything together, and that's called the basting. And they would, these little girls were used to pull out the basting stitches, and so the finished garment was ready to go to, into the shops. And some of these workers were as young as three or four years old. And the average wage for those younger people was $1.50 a week, and they worked from 7.30 in the morning until 9 at night. That's a long day. Now, this picture says mo the workers were mostly immigrant women, yes. The, half the workers were from the Russian part of the pale. Almost half of them were from Italy, from Sicily, and there was one Irish girl working the day that this happened, uh, the story happened. Okay, this picture is different in, in, than, I didn't know things when I drew this picture. This is an early picture that I didn't know that as they cut and fashion the, the, what they were working on, they would cut off scraps and the scraps would build up on the floor so that, and they weren't often cleaned out. And so you'd come to work, you'd be wading ankle deep through scraps to get to your sewing machine. And as you, the work would be, that you needed to do would be stacked up high all around you and over your head there was a bar where you would reach up when you finished sewing a shirt waist, you would reach up and hang it on a hanger over your head. So all around each sewer was this mass of, of fabric in various conditions. Scraps and finished goods and goods ready to be made. Then with the grandfather's part of the story, I drew half of it with the cartoon style when, about the factory. The factory part of the story, I drew half of it about in cartoon style and half of it were in these older sort of styles of the, that I thought matched the times. Here's a bunch of little thread girls and button girls. They're sewing on buttons. Um, working with a, an older person there to supervise. Here's girls who just change the threads in the bigger sewing machines. And she's doing some sort of sewing or basting pulling. And so that was what it was like in there. Long hours, 
a, a lot of difficult times, and it was, but here comes the really, really bad part, and why Peter felt that his grandfather's story was hard to tell. That, that's a key. When they went to work, the workers went in through one door of this, and up to the eighth floor of this high-rise building, and once they went into where they worked, into this huge long hall, the door was locked. They were locked in while they worked. The reason they were locked in is the boss thought they were going to steal from him. And they'd go out on the street and hand off one of the finished shirts to some friend and he would be losing money. So they kept the doors locked while he was at work. He didn't trust them. And that is a, a worldwide scenario in sweatshops that seems to happen that the bosses lose they don't trust their workers, and so they do something like this. And invariably, I don't know why it is, but a locked door in a sweatshop seems to invite a fire because it's happened all over the world again and again from ever since there were sweatshops up to the present. And uh, so here's how I drew this part of the story. And it says, on a Saturday afternoon on March 25th, 1911, a fire broke out on the eighth floor at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. And I drew that in two styles. The the cartoon style, and then later on, I drew that more arty style, and I'd say, fire! And so, what happened? The garments, were the, they don't know where the fire started, but it probably was a spark from a sewing machine or from one of the wires down on the floor covered up with scraps. But the scraps caught fire, they roar, blazed up, they caught fire to the stuff on her table, and then they shot up to the things hanging over her head and burned them. So everything just went whoosh into an incredible inferno. And workers ran for getting out of there and discovered the locked door. There was a freight elevator that they tried to get on, but it broke and, and didn't go anymore. There was a fire escape, but it fell off the building because too many people tried to go down it. And some people got away across the roofs by finding a way up to the, to the, um, the boss's office up on the roof. And, but not very many escaped. Not everyone was there that day. It was, the, um, it was a Saturday and so the, or the most observant Jews, that was their Sabbath, and they weren't there. But it was still a, a, the, it was a horrible event for many, many hundreds of people. And the last picture I drew for some time, because it just made me so sad, were these last two of women falling. And this with the, had the words t just t torn at random from the book that I was using, the library book. And I was surprised later when I looked at it, when it said, I shall always remember you. And this one says, dead as long as, and then it says, Peter, I am frightened. And I thought, well, that was amazing words to have chosen there. And when I had to change the words on this thing so it could be published, I went on to Photoshop, and I put the Photoshop cursor on one line, and I ran it along the next line so that two lines would be combined into one, and it turned the words, it turned the, the lettering into nonsense. But here I didn't do it. I left it as it was in the original book because it was so meaningful to me. This is how the streets looked with the people who didn't want to be burned jumped out the windows. And there were touching and hideously painful stories about that, that the falling of these girls through the air because it was, it, it, there were workplace accidents all the time in America and they were hidden. They happened inside of the, factories and nobody saw them happen. But this happened on a main street in broad daylight, the end of the day, but people were going about their business shopping for their dinner. And it wasn't like now where there'd be grocery stores. You went from the grocery, from the butcher to the baker to the green grocer who had the vegetables and you shopped at different stores. So you're in and up, going up and down the street and suddenly there are women leaping from this building and falling to their deaths on the sidewalk nine floors down and eight floors down. And it was, it was unbelievably horrible. And then people look up and they see the building is the, on that floor is all on fire. And there's a young man standing in the window and women behind him being pushed up to the window by the fire. And he is taking each one by a hand. He helps her up onto the windowsill. He says a few words to her and then helps her step off into space. And then the next one and the next one. And one by one, he says goodbye to all his friends as she, he helps them step into death. And then the last girl that can get through the fire 
He helps her up, they hold hands together, and they step off together. And nobody was ever sure who he was among the men who were working there, who were up on the fl next floor up. And he must have come down to help his friends. And uh, so there were acts of, of heroic courage, but mostly it was an event of unknown people dramatically dying in the front of the eyes of, of, of the public. And the horror of this event, because it was seen by so many hundreds of people, it did something unexpected. It opened the door to allow labor unions to have a chance to support workers. They had been kept out by the bosses, and now they, they were able to get rules for safe working conditions and for fair wages and for all the things of protecting workers that the unions took, uh, took control of. And many people had been trying to organize for better working conditions, and now they just jammed the streets, and the hundreds of thousands of people showed up for the funeral marches for the victims and just for labor marches in general. And people were, it was all happened because of this ghastly fire. And historians say that the owners, the, Peter's grandfather, didn't do, as Peter said, he told me he didn't do anything that all the work, all the bosses didn't do. And they say that it was common practice at the time to lock the workers in. It just he was the one that, that caused this nightmare. And so, but people still argue about this. It was, a, it was a big, important thing to discuss. Peter's grandfather and his cousin, who uh, some people say was just a friend, but Peter says, no, they were cousins and they married sisters. And they were accused of being responsible for the worst workplace disaster in the United States, maybe ever. They were tried in a criminal case, uh, and they were set free because there was no proof that they themselves had locked the door with that key. They ordered the key to be used to lock the door, perhaps, but there was no proof. Whoever locked the door was probably dead in the fire, and they themselves couldn't be blamed. And so here is a picture from the book saying, clean hands. He got off with clean hands, except he really didn't because everybody knew what he had done or what he was accused of, be, of doing, and it looked very bad for him. And a week later, in all the newspapers in New York City, he took out an ad saying, the shirtwaist company is still open for business. Try, visit us at our new location, gave the location, and guess who visited? The fire marshal, and he said they broke all the same rules. Too many benches, too many sewing machines, all crammed into a small space, space that were in so tight that you couldn't get the emergency door open. And so they were shut down on that, and he moved off to California to do some other line of work. And. Uh, but the, most of the family stayed in New York, but they were deeply ashamed of this, and they raised Peter to never talk about this disgrace. And that's a lot of the book that I'm not going to put down here, but it, it shows how his life has been lived to carry a secret that he was told to never tell. Never tell it. It was too horrible to tell, and don't ever let the family be blamed for this. And so he had to carry this burden all his life. And then he tells someone, and what did I do? I drew it. So that was a, but he didn't, was never blaming or angry at me about it. He didn't ask to see my work. He wasn't that interested in that I did that, except to say that this might be the only biography he would ever have. And he's an artist, and he liked the fact that I talked about the, his development as an artist in the book. And that's the last part of the, the book about Peter, and if, of him reading, and then it, as he reads the our body sort of falling through his, his thoughts. And, that, and then it says that art is a way to talk about things that otherwise can't be said. And the book then ends with uh, pictures of the victims of the fire, the ones that had photographs. I looked at their photographs and drew their pictures. And that is the last, the last part of the book. And to me, this was the extremely mo moving and difficult to draw. And it's just, these are the people who, who had pictures who died in the fire. And, uh, and I drew them and drew them and drew them until I ran out of, till I ran out of pictures and that ended the book. And then here is the end and there's Peter relaxing outdoors under a tree. And it was a pleasure to share this project with you.